Atari Lynx experiences the power of three. One, two, three, uh, four. Well, anyway, it's a look at third party releases for 1990 on Atari Lynx for this episode of Game Boy Works Guide In. Given Atari's deep arcade roots, the Lynx's library would naturally be weighted toward arcade conversions. Granted, Lynx was owned by Atari Corp, the home computing company owned by Commodore founder Jack Tramiel, while the Atari that was the late 80s arcade powerhouse was Atari Games, a separate entity. But clearly they maintained a cordial relationship, given that a full third of Lynx's 1990 output consisted of Atari Games ports and sequels. It helped too that Lynx's hardware allowed developers to create convincing adaptations of arcade hits. That undoubtedly accounts not only for the presence of Atari arcade titles on Lynx, but also of some solid third-party releases as well. Interestingly, all four of 1990's licensed arcade ports for Lynx appeared on Nintendo's Game Boy or NES as well, for a true apples-to-apples -apples comparison against Atari's competition, namely the Game Boy. One point of interest with these games, so far as I can tell, these licensed adaptations were handled in-house by Atari and Epic's talent. This would likely account for why Lynx's release schedule was so sparse compared to Game Boy's. Rather than relying on licensees to adapt their work, Atari had to do the heavy lifting themselves, which makes the high quality of these ports all the more remarkable, given the time crunch involved. Also notable is that many of Lynx's licensed arcade titles hail from manufacturers with close ties to Atari. Namco and Atari had a long-standing relationship that had strengthened as the two companies buckled down to compete with Nintendo's NES, and both Midway and Williams became connected to Atari at the hip in 1986 as part of the latter company's post-crash sell-off. When it comes to Namco and Tingen's Lynx conversion of arcade classic Ms. Pac-Man, the direct comparison to Game Boy actually works out in Lynx's favor. For one thing, Nintendo's platforms wouldn't see a properly licensed, and therefore widely distributed, version of Ms. Pac-Man until 1993, at least not in the US, the only market where Lynx had any real presence to speak of. 1993 saw Nintendo and Namco finally burying the axe and deciding to be friends again after their mid-80s falling out over Famicom licensing fees. It's also when Ms. Pac-Man arrived on Game Gear, which means Lynx had an exclusive lock on this game for three years. Now is a three-year exclusive on a decade-old arcade game really that big a deal? Not really in the grand scheme of things, but it's probably worth noting as one of the few times third-party licensing worked out in Lynx's favor over Game Boy. Over on NES, Ms. Pac-Man did arrive right around the same time as the Lynx release, as a Tengen title without an official Nintendo license. Since Tengen was an offshoot of Atari, none of those corporate politics applied to Lynx. So Ms. Pac-Man arrived on Lynx well ahead of a proper Game Boy or Game Gear version. The question is, was the Lynx adaptation actually any good? The answer is yes, but it could have been better. Maybe it's the Atari connection, but this conversion of Ms. Pac-Man resembles nothing so much as the Atari 400 home computer version of the original Pac-Man. That's actually not a bad baseline to work from, but it bizarrely fails to take advantage of the Lynx hardware. Pac-Man and its sequels and other games on its hardware have always been poster children for the tragedy of arcade classics that have suffered in being ported to home systems due to resolution discrepancies. Namco designed these early 80s arcade titles around vertical monitors, so moving them to 4 to 3 television screens always means either compressing them on the vertical axis or introducing a scrolling feature. Certainly that was the case with Pac-Man on Game Boy, the default mode on that port only gave players a window into about two-thirds of the maze at any given time, with the action scrolling up and down to follow Pac-Man, and often cropping out the movements of the ghosts. For the Lynx conversion, Atari widely recognized that only being able to see a portion of the maze is a non-starter, so they squashed the game along the vertical axis. A lot, actually, since Lynx had a much wider aspect ratio than a standard television did. You see where this is going, right? Lynx was designed to be used vertically. We've already seen two games that rotate the action and the system 90 degrees, Clax and Gauntlet. Those format shenanigans didn't even really make sense for Gauntlet, but they'd have been perfect here. Not only was Ms. Pac-Man designed around a vertical screen ratio, its button-free control scheme would have made for a more comfortable play experience than Gauntlet or Clax, which required players to grip and manipulate the system at both the top and bottom. Instead, we get crunched down mazes and tiny character sprites that lose essential details, namely the whites of ghost eyes to predict their movements. It's a baffling choice when the potential for a near-perfect arcade port was right there. Is this a lot of hand-wringing over a minor feature? Sure, but it's not like there's a lot to Ms. Pac-Man. And the original arcade game was the best take on the Pac-Man concept until Pac-Man CE came along decades later, so little details matter. To its credit, the Lynx port does give the impression that its developers attempted to compensate for the compromised visuals through other means. For starters, you can play one of two interpretations of the game. 
Mode A is the classic arcade original with the four standard mazes, while Mode B introduces a ton of new maze designs that capitalize on the Lynx's resolution. And while I say this game is a button-free experience, it would be more accurate to say it's mostly button-free. Tengen remixed Ms. Pac-Man pretty significantly in bringing the game to NES and Genesis in 1990, and Atari seems to have based this port on those reworkings. In addition to the extra mazes, there's also a special new feature in Mode B, a speed booster power-up. By collecting a lightning bolt that appears from time to time beneath the Ghost House, players can hold a temporary speed upgrade in reserve, to be activated with the press of a button. It's a clever nod to the game's arcade heritage. A surprising percentage of Ms. Pac-Man arcade boards through the years have been hacked to upgrade the speed of the action. Namco tends not to acknowledge these tweaks. In fact, they tend not to acknowledge Ms. Pac-Man in general thanks to its outside origins, so seeing a long-standing arcade operator tradition incorporated into this adaptation is great. Otherwise, Ms. Pac-Man on Lynx looks good despite the visual crunch. It sounds pretty crisp too, not quite arcade perfect, but solid. And it plays generally well, even if the Lynx's mushy diagonals can impede cornering. This was still nearly a decade away from the Neo Geo Pocket Color and its clicky stick inhibitor collar for Pac-Man and Crush Roller, so we just have to make do. Where Ms. Pac-Man is an undisputed all-time arcade classic, the same can't really be said for Midway's Rampage, a game that is big, stupid, and shallow. But those very characteristics are exactly what made it a great arcade experience. It held up less impressively in home conversions because home systems tended to be poor at big, so mostly Rampage on consoles and computers was just dumb and shallow. Certainly that was the case for the NES port, which shipped in 1988 and really showed off the feeble nature of the console's aging hardware. By comparison, the Lynx rendition might actually be the most impressive home version of the arcade original produced back in the day, period. It compares favorably to the Atari ST and Amiga versions, and it completely demolishes any 8-bit adaptation. That's not just on a visual level either, but in terms of features as well. In fact, Link's Rampage improves on the arcade version. Fundamentally, the core appeal of Rampage was the opportunity to basically be King Kong, or Godzilla pretending to be King Kong. It's a game about chaotic destruction meant to be played by several people at once, all competing to wreak the most havoc on innocent cities around the world. Each player takes the role of one of several monsters that are, as the title indicates, rampaging. Gameplay consists entirely of smashing up buildings while avoiding taking too much damage from the tiny humans attempting to defend their cities. The puny people peppering your marauding monsters with bullets and bombs aren't just there as a nuisance, however, they're also sustenance. Chomp a handful of soldiers or innocents and you regain a little health. And you can always antagonize your rival beasts by punching or jumping on them, knocking them loose from the skyscrapers they're ascending, or leaving them vulnerable to human attacks. It's a very silly, very energetic game. There's not much to it, but as brief time wasters go, it's a pretty great bargain for 25 cents. The Lynx version obviously lacks the high resolution visuals of the arcade machine, which depicted an entire zoomed out city at a single time. Rather than scale the visuals down, Atari's programmers took the same approach as most Game Boy console or arcade conversions we've seen to date. They retained the pixel dimensions of in-game objects with a zoomed in viewpoint. This can sometimes be one of those literal compromises in that it compromises the fundamental game experience. Rampage, though, honestly doesn't turn out so badly. Although the close cropping can make it a little harder to keep an eye on all the threats you're dealing with at any given time, Rampage isn't the kind of game where that matters quite so much as in others. There are the humans defending their cities with guns and military vehicles, and of course you always need to worry about the bad intentions of other players, but the appeal of Rampage is in watching giant monsters dismantle skyscrapers and devour hapless humans. On that front, this port delivers in spades. You'll take tons of damage from off screen, but this version is balanced so generously that you kind of don't need to worry about it. More importantly, this version is built around multiplayer every bit as much as the arcade game is. Maybe even more so. For starters, Rampage on Lynx supports not two, not three, but four players simultaneously. The arcade machine was a three-person setup, which means the Lynx port adds a new character, a giant rat named Larry. Larry joins the existing cast of George, a massive ape, Lizzie, the towering lizard, and Ralph, a Brobdingnagian wolf, for theoretically greater havoc than was possible even in the coin-op. Admittedly, the zoomed-in viewpoint means that a full four-person multiplayer session, if such a thing ever actually happened, would rarely depict all four player avatars at once, but nevertheless, it's a mildly ambitious addition. As far as I can tell, once again not having access to three other people with Lynx systems in this time of pandemic and social distancing, the multiplayer viewpoint follows each individual player's character rather than zooming out or providing a fixed window into the action that forces everyone to cluster together. This allows the action to scroll around as the player moves, 
giving them a close view of their specific chaos and occasionally bringing other participants into the madness. Admittedly, this doesn't change the fact that Rampage on Lynx is every bit as dumb and repetitive as the arcade game. This version lacks any kind of password system, so reaching the end requires a commitment of a couple of hours and probably an AC adapter for your Lynx. But as arcade conversions go, Rampage on Lynx is as faithful as they could be, with massive graphics, tons happening on screen at any given time, and luxurious four-player action. Now, here's a familiar face. We've looked at Rygar twice in the past year or so, both on NES Works and Metroidvania Works. But both of those retrospectives were about the NES version of the game, which is a very different experience than what showed up here on Lynx. Though that was a strong and inventive game, it was almost completely unlike the arcade version. But this here, this is the arcade version. Rygar and Lynx, in keeping with the platform's apparent mission, quite faithfully adapts the coin-op title for the small screen. And I do mean small screen. Like Rampage, Rygar and Lynx carries over the visuals of the original upright very faithfully, which means it involves big, detailed sprites in a very cramped world. And, like Rampage, this doesn't matter as much here as it could, given the simplistic nature of the game. The original Rygar lacks the sprawling complexity of the NES version. It scrolls left to right for a few dozen stages with no vertical movement, no backtracking, no side paths. You're just booking it to the right until you run out of lives or defeat the evil final boss, Liger. There's not really much to Rygar as seen in arcades, and this version doesn't change that. You are the warrior of Argul, running and jumping to the right, hitting bad guys with your spiked shield on a chain, and occasionally hopping over bottomless pits. At least this version carries over many of the nice little details of the arcade game. The famous sunset is depicted in several of the backgrounds. You can acquire upgrades and time bonuses to extend play. Your protagonist can hop on enemies to stun them. The end of each stage features the same bizarre muscleman statues seen in the arcade, with transitional conduits that you enter by embracing squat monster sculptures and rotating around them. It's a short, slight game, incredibly repetitive, and awfully difficult in places. Atari's programmers toned down the challenge level by reducing the number of enemies you face at once, but this version has some quirks that still make it tough. The jump and attack buttons are reversed from the Nintendo A and B standard, which appears to be fairly common on Lynx. More frustratingly, your disc armor weapon no longer has its spinning upward attack, and it can only destroy a single enemy at a time. Both of these details can lead to uncomfortable situations. Even so, it's probably the most faithful rendition of the coin-op version we'd get until Tecmo started putting out proper arcade ports, and that counts for something. The final third-party release for Atari Lynx for 1990 is a conversion of Midway's minor arcade classic, Xenophobe, a game whose creators basically said, what if we made an Aliens game, except we didn't bother to get the Aliens license? Unlike Konami and Contra, the answer didn't work out to be Rambo and Dutch shooting their way through an alien's guts, but instead played more like Spy vs. Spy with Alien. Once again, the Lynx conversion compares admirably to those other renditions, and largely for the same reasons that Rampage fares well here. It embraces the Lynx's capabilities and limitations in equal measure to create a unique but thoughtful take on the property. Not unlike Rampage, Xenophobe supported three-person simultaneous play in arcades, which translated to two- or three-player simultaneous action on home conversions. And much like Rampage, Xenophobe on Lynx supports four people playing simultaneously. Also like Rampage, Xenophobe centers its action within Lynx's tiny pixel resolution to focus on each player on their own screen. The great thing about Xenophobe is that it's inherently suited to work with standalone Lynx play. In arcades, Xenophobe split the screen into three separate viewpoints, one following each player. This created three individual mini-screens, each limited to a vertical resolution, yet fairly wide, which describes the Lynx screen to a T. The idea of each player enjoying their own personal screen in linked multiplayer was inherent to handheld gaming, dating way back to long before the advent of Game Boy or Lynx to 1984 and Nintendo's Game & Watch style Yakuman game. Xenophobe is a creepy, stressful, fast-paced game in which players must navigate a series of bases around the galaxy, clearing them of an alien infestation before the base self-destructs. It plays like a combination of the run-and-gun portions of the movie Aliens, with the panicked Nostromo evacuation of the original Alien, with an additional element of cooperative competitive play added. You can team up with other players to take on the aliens together, or race ahead of them to try and score the best power-ups and health boosts 
to improve your survivability. In other versions of the game, you can always keep tabs on the location and progress of other players by glancing at their portion of the screen. Here, that's impossible. I'm guessing here since, once again, I haven't been able to play Link's Xenophobe with someone else, but I have to assume this increases the sense of isolation you experience as you play, even with an increased player count. Not to mention the Space Marine squad sensation of shouting out your location and tactics to other players. Unless, of course, you intend to go it alone. While the graphics in this port are less detailed than in the coin-op version, and less detailed than in several other home versions like the Atari ST and Amiga as well, they're reasonably attractive and certainly look better than on older platforms like NES and Spectrum. But more importantly, the Lynx version recreates the features and chaos of the arcade game as effectively as you could hope. As in the original, you can arm yourself with a variety of handy weapons ranging from powerful grenades that inflict dangerous, indiscriminate splash damage, electric beams that stun and damage aliens, knives that can quickly cut you free of alien tentacles, and more. You also need to learn the behaviors of aliens, which include eggs that launch face huggers, acid spitting adult forms that can knock the player's weapon from their hand, and the powerful queen alien. Each base has a distinct layout that includes a variety of different features ranging from weapon dispensers to laser traps to computers that can be used to temporarily halt the countdown. It's a great port of the arcade original, one of the stronger coin-op conversions available for Lynx. And taken all together, these four third-party arcade ports highlight a big portion of the system's appeal over the Game Boy for 1990. Where arcade adaptations on Game Boy invariably have felt like massive downgrades or had to be reinvented altogether to work within the hardware, Link's conversions seem capable of walking the delicate line between fidelity and compromise. At the same time, the fact that there are only four of these out of 12 total releases for the system throughout all of 1990 versus the several dozen releases Game Boy saw in the US alone that year, well, that highlights the uneven value proposition of Atari's Lynx. Impressive games, but not a lot of them, and a bit one note overall.